。こちらはシンウェイですね。シンウェイは中国の名前なんですが、私はによっていいにくいんだけど、<笑>これですね。シュウシンフイを合ってる。中国語も話せるし。ああシンウェイはそろそろああの文法の関係な話をします、えー、すごくあ楽しい話私もあ一回聞きましたけどあ英語でアメリカので今回はシンウェイやっぱり日本語で頑張ります You're gonna go in Japanese and do the whole thing in Japanese yeah, right? No. Yeah. No. <笑>間違ってるかもしれないけど皆さん楽しんでください握手Hello,、uh, as Jonan said, my name is Sing Wei Su, and in Chinese, that is Xu Xing Hui. Now, I don't speak any Japanese, but I know that Japanese kanji derives from、uh, Chinese Han characters.、Um, and though I understand it's not always a perfect translation, my name,、um, at least in Chinese, means to do with or capable of wisdom. But、um, my parents are from Taiwan, and apparently, even the usage of Chinese in,、uh, that's spoken in Taiwan versus mainland China is different enough. That when I introduced myself、uh, to people in Beijing, they would be taken aback that my name was Xing Hui, because apparently, this is a homophobe for another set of characters meaning to offer a bribe. So that wasn't great. <laughs> so perhaps it was fate of having an ambiguous name that led me to thinking about parsing languages、um, and foreign languages in general. I became even more interested、uh, in thinking about how they work when I was teaching English as a foreign language. And I had to try to explain why so many words in English, such as flies, could have、uh, different meanings depending on how you used it.、Um, so, anyway, when I was learning how, to,、uh, le learning how to program and looking into how computer languages are parsed, I noticed how there's actually a lot of similarities、uh, to the way humans parse sentences in the languages they hear and read every day. Now, I'm a relative newcomer to the programming world, so I never learned about parsers or compilers or anything、uh, in school. So, I have an alt title for this talk, which is How I Accidentally a Computer Science, and So Can You. Of course, this isn't going to be a comprehensive survey of parsers, but I wanted to share how I came across them because, as someone who does not have a CS degree, I had no idea what they were until I sort of ran into them by accident. So, I had been building Rails apps for a while, and one day I got tired of just blindly trusting all that Rails magic and wanted to see how things really worked underneath the hood. Specifically, I was trying to figure out how routing worked. So I went to GitHub and started poking around the Rails source code. And I came across a file called parser.rb. And I was like, cool, I did something like that before、um, as an exercise. So I thought I knew what it would probably look like. But then I looked at the file, and it was nothing what I expected. <laughs> like, it was a bunch of arrays with numbers. Like, where, where was the logic? Where was the code? Who, who even wrote this stuff? <laughs> So I was like, okay, that's not enough. Looking closer, I saw that previous, that, the, that previous file was actually generated using a different file called parser.y. So I went and looked at that. Still didn't make any sense. It barely even looked like any Ruby code that I recognized, like semicolons. What, what was that? So that's when I decided to figure out what this all meant. So to get warmed you up to the idea of parsing, let's play a game. I hope most of you have played it before, but for those of you who may not be familiar, This is the word game where one person asks for certain kinds of words, like a noun or an adjective, to make sentences. So, for example, I need a verb. Anyone? Spark.、Mm、hmm. <laughs> Any other verbs? Drink. Drank. Great. The young man drank. Didn't plant that one at all. <laughs> so, the young man drank. This seems like a perfectly valid sentence.、Uh, if all you can remember from your middle school grammar lessons,、uh, we can diagram the sentence into a subject and a verb, where the verb is drank. And since all sentences need a subject to actually do the verb,、uh, we know that the subject is the young man. So that makes sense, right? But let's see if there's other possible sentences that could have started with the young man. For example, the young man did something. So here I need a verb and a noun. We can stick with our original verb, drank. So, any suggestions for a noun? Anyone? Peanut gallery. No. <laughs> Anyone else? Beer. Beer. Or since we're in Japan, sake. Great. The young man drank sake. Also grammatical. 
This time, instead of uh, just subject plus verb, we have a subject plus verb plus object, which abides by the rules of English grammar if we interpret the young man as the subject, drank as the verb, and beer, uh, sake as the object. But still, can we come up with even more possibilities for valid sentences that start with the young man, either using subject plus verb or subject plus, plus verb plus object, or even something else? So for example, I need a noun, anyone? Even less crickets. <laughs> so for example, is this a grammatical sentence? The young man, the boat. Based on the previous sentences, at first it's easy to assume that the subject for this sentence is still the young man. So when we see the boat, our brains are like, nope, not a sentence. And this is because we know that a subject has to be followed by a verb. But it turns out you can parse this sentence a different way. Here, if we interpret the subject as the young, as in the young people, we see that it still follows the same rules as the sentence, the young man drank sake, which was subject plus verb plus direct object. We were initially led astray because we tend to think of man as a noun, and therefore in the previous sentence as part of a subject, and not a verb. This kind of sentence is called a garden path sentence. So garden path sentences are those that contain a word that could be interpreted in more than one way, so that you think the sentence is going in one direction before pivoting on that ambiguous word and going in a different direction. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana, follows that pa pattern. Here, the pivot word is like, which in the first clause signals to the reader that flies is used as a verb, and in the second clause, like is itself the verb and allows us to understand flies as a noun. Other examples are the prime number few. This sentence tricks us because we are used to thinking of prime number as a noun phrase similar to young man, but similar to that example here, number is the verb. In the sentence, the man who hunts ducks out on weekends, ducks might first be interpreted as a noun that complements the verb for ducks, but is in fact part of the phrasal verb ducks out. And similarly, the woman who whistles tunes pianos. For the Japanese speakers in the audience, a similar phenomenon is possible with adjective clauses, which can be cause for ambiguity about which action goes with which agent. So in this sentence, you might think that the sentence is saying the, the teacher drank sake, but if you continue on and read the, the rest of the sentence, the drinking sake actually applies to the student and the teacher's actually doing advising. And I hope that's actually correct because I don't know Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> So ambiguity in words or sentence structure uh, can produce hilarious unintentional second meanings for newspaper headlines such as, a grandmother of eight makes a hole in one. Complaints about NBA referees growing ugly. <laughs> and my personal favorite, milk drinkers are turning to powder. Think about that for a second. So regardless of the ambiguity in natural languages like English, we can all agree that as speakers of a language, there are certain grammar rules uh, that we are aware of that allow us to make a decision as to whether or not a sentence is a valid expression in that language. As we've seen with the last few examples, we know that one possible kind of valid sentence in English consists of a, su a subject plus a verb plus stuff. Most of us probably did some kind of sentence diagramming in school that looked something like this. So at the top of the tree, we have a sentence, which we can break up into its constituent parts, such as a noun phrase and a verb phrase, which then in turn get broken down further until every word in the sentence can be added as a leaf on the tree. In this tree, the leaves are the words for the sentence, John lost his pants, but the same tree could apply to the young man the boat. These kinds of trees are constructed based on grammar rules. The convention usually used to describe grammars in the computing world is a notation called bacchus Naur form, or BNF. <clears throat> in BNF notation, you have a set of rules that together describe the language or can define every possible sentence in the language. There are two kinds of symbols used to express each kind of rule, terminals and non-terminals, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, in a bit. The basic format of each production rule is that there is a left-hand side, which produces a right-hand side, or rather, it can be rewritten as what's on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, you have a single non-terminal symbol or token, which produces either a terminal or a sequence of terminals and non-terminals. So, for example, a super simplified subset of production rules of English sentences, based on the previous slide that we saw, might be something like, at the top level, a sentence becoming a subject followed by predicate, and then a predicate becoming a verb followed by stuff. Here, we can see an example of 10 production rules to describe both of the sentences that we created earlier. 
the young man drank sake, and the young man the boat. <clears throat> These rules make use of six non-terminals, sentence, noun phrase, verb phrase, noun, verb, and article, and seven terminals, which are simply the words the, a, young, man, boat, sake, and drink. Using this grammar, we can start at the top level and keep applying production rules until we generate the full sentence. So we start with the sentence, which can be rewritten as a noun phrase and a verb phrase. The noun phrase then translates into an article plus a noun, which in the next step hit the terminals of the for the article and young for noun. Similarly, the, the verb phrase can be rewritten as a verb plus noun phrase, which then in turn become man plus noun phrase and so forth. Um, the noun phrase becomes article plus noun, the article becomes the, and the noun becomes boat. And similarly, we can apply these same rules to the young man drank sake. But what does this all have to do with computers? It turns out that the process by which we parse and understand a sentence in natural languages is not too different from what goes on in a computer language parser. The basic flow of what happens to your code can be seen here. Your code gets fed into a lexer or tokenizer, which breaks up, uh, each, breaks up each sentence into recognizable units. These get fed to the parser, which for most computer languages outputs an abstract syntax tree that can be then walked by the compiler or interpreter to produce uh, CPU instructions. Of course, most of us don't spend most of our time implementing new programming languages, but by better understanding the lexer and parser steps, we may be able to see how we can use parsers for simpler situations. So rather than a Ruby script, you can feed anything, a log file, a markdown document, or even just a plain string into your parser and get some kind of output, which doesn't even necessarily have to be a tree. It could be a different data structure, for example, or even something as simple as a Boolean. So let's look at lexing or tokenizing. All this means is turning your input into a sequence of tokens that your parser can recognize. These tokens will then be matched to the grammar rules that describes the language you are parsing. So let's look at a simple example. Let's build a parser that can handle super basic binary operations in math, such as addition, subtraction, and multiplication. The entire language will consist of just an integer, followed by an operator, and then by another integer. The grammar rules here are pretty simple. We only need three of them to describe every possible sentence in our mini math language. The start symbol here is the expression, which consists of three non-terminal symbols or tokens, a number token, an operator, and a to an operator token, and then another no number token. The number token can then be rewritten as any digit notated above using a regular expression, and the operator token can be rewritten as a plus, minus, or time symbol in, th in the last production rule. So here's a simple implementation of a tokenizer in Ruby. It just uses regular expression matching, pretty much identical to the one that we saw in our actual production rules, to grab tokens of either type number or operator, and then it returns them in an array. So when we input the string three plus seven, we should get a three element array. And so now we wanna pass this into the parser. Ultimately, we wanna end up with a kind of tree that looks like this. So that when you feed this tree to the interpreter, it sees the head of the tree and knows to execute the operation of addition on the left child and right child. A trivial implementation of a parser might look, look something like this. You have a parser that only expresses three tokens in a specific order and outputs a tree with a single node uh, containing the operator and two children, which are the number tokens to be operated on. So super simple. But now, for some slightly harder math. So take, for example, this expression two times parentheses three plus seven. With this expression, we need slightly more complicated rules to describe it. Whereas before, our first production rule was expression equals num followed by operator followed by num. Now we have at the top level, expression becomes num operator expression, where expression can be rewritten as either an expression in parentheses or just a number. The number and operator non-terminals still translate as they did before in the previous production rules. So we tokenize our input and get an array of seven tokens. And this is ultimately the tree that we want to build, but how do we tell the parser to construct the tree correctly? One common approach is to use a top-down parser that looks ahead one token to decide what grammar rule to follow. Like garden path sentences, we need to know what comes after a given token to know what kind of rule to use to understand the sentence. So for example, knowing that the young man is followed by a noun, the boat, allows us to know that the, what the subject and verb of the sentence are. If you can adhere to a grammar rule when you consume each token, then you're good to go. But if you can't, then you reach an error state and the parser throws, throws a parse error. 
So here, we start with the first token, which is the number token. Since peeking ahead uh, at the next token tells us that we have an operator coming up, we know that the only possible rule we can follow is the one that says an expression is a number followed by an operator followed by an expression. So we can start building our tree with a node of two. Shifting over to the next token, we have an operator. Peeking ahead, we know that the next token is a parentheses. The only grammar rule that has an operator followed by a parentheses is still the first one, so we know that so far we're still in the realm of grammatical correctness. So since there's no parse error, we can use the trivial parser from before and set the operator token as the head of our tree. So now we consume the parentheses, and we can see that the next token is a number. Since we know that a valid expression can either be a number or a number plus operator plus expression, we still haven't violated any grammar rules, so we can continue parsing and update the right child of our tree to be evaluated later. Now we consume the number token, holding the value three. Previously, we knew we, that we had two options, either interpret the expression as becoming just a number symbol that terminates to a three, or as part of the first production rule, which states that an expression can become a number followed by an operator and then an expression. Since we can peek ahead to the next token, which is an operator, this gives us, gives us enough information to know which rule to follow, which is in fact the second one. So now we know that the expression we have as the right child, um, as the right child of a tree will in turn be a binary expression, uh, sorry, a binary operation. And using the same parser, we know that the three will be the left child of that subtree. So now we consume the operator token and see that it's a plus. Peeking ahead to the seven, we know that it adheres to the same production rule that we decided in the previous step, which tells us we're good to keep parsing, and so we can add the plus, as, plus operator as the head of the subtree. Now we reach the seven, which we already know from the previous step to be an expression of some sort. The look ahead tells us that our current token must terminate into a number. When we consume the final parentheses, this completes a sub-expression of expression becoming parentheses expression, and so now, now we can build our complete tree. If, on the other hand, there had been no parentheses, then the second rule would have been violated, and we would not have been able to construct a valid syntax tree. So looking at a summary of the steps we took to build our syntax tree, you may have noticed that we often had to call expression from within an expression call. In other words, the process that we went through to parse, um, to parse a sentence was recursive. And since we were building the tree from the top down, this method of parsing is also called recursive descent. This is probably the most common type of parser that people might try to write by hand, but there are a number of problems with, this, uh, with recursive descent. For one, the recursive nature of the process makes it relatively inefficient. So you may end up checking a token against every single grammar rule before you can parse it. Or, if you're not careful in how you write your grammar rules, you'll end up with infinite recursion. So, for example, if you have a production rule that says an expression equals an expression followed by an operator followed by an expression, then when you hit the first token, you go back to expression, which produces expression, operator, expression, which goes back to expression, and so forth ad infinitum. Finally, uh, you sometimes have limitations in the way or order you write the grammar rules for your language. In the case of a calculus language like this one, depending on the order you write your grammar rules, you'll potentially run into issues with associativity. That is, if you say two minus three plus five, how does the parser know whether or not to give precedence to the addition or subtraction? So another approach to parsing instead, instead builds the parse tree from the bottom up. The key difference here is that this approach makes use of a stack that you can push tokens onto until there are enough tokens on the stack that, to fulfill a grammar rule, at which point they get reduced and popped off. For that reason, this kind of approach to parsing is called shift-reduce parsing. So let's go back to our slightly hard math example. Here we start with the first token, the two. We push it onto the stack for the moment. <clears throat> Based on the grammar rules, we know that, um, that a two is a terminal for a number token, so the stack reduces it uh, to the left-hand side, left side symbol of num. Then we set aside the two as a building block for our eventual tree. Now we shift over and consume the next token, which is a time sign. This gets pushed onto the stack, and then we look at the grammar. The rule that matches is operator becomes multiplication, so we reduce the token on the stack and move it over. We then shift again and grab the parentheses. We add it to the stack. Since this looks like it could be covered by the rule where expression becomes parentheses expression, uh, but we don't have enough information yet uh, to do anything else, we just keep it in the stack for now and keep parsing. The next token is now a three, which we push. Again, applying the first grammar rule, we reduce the three to a num, 
token in our stack and set it aside. Shifting over to the plus sign, we add it to the stack as usual and then look at our grammar and we know that this is an operator token. So the next action is another reduce and once again we set it aside. Our next action is to shift. We push the next token to the stack, apply our production rules, which recognizes a number token, but also that a number is a kind of expression. So our stack executes another reduce action and we put our seven aside. So at this point, the tokens on our stack have fulfilled a rule that our grammar recognizes, namely that an expression can become a number and followed by an operator followed by an expression. So now the stack takes the three tokens involved in the rule and reduces them to simply an expression, shown now on the stack, shown now on the stack uh, in green. So now our parser knows what to do with those elements involved and can create a subtree from the three plus and seven in the same way that we saw previously in the top down parser. So that's all the reducing that can be done for now. So again, we shift to consume the last token. At this point, oh, again, we push it onto our stack and now again, the tokens at the top have fulfilled another grammar rule, which is expression becomes parentheses expression. So since the three tokens at the top of the stack fulfill a grammar rule, the stack reduces the parentheses expression in parentheses into an expression token as per the rule. So now the tokens we have left on the stack are number, operator, and expression. But now we're out of state again, where the tokens at the top of the stack have met yet another grammar rule, which is expression becomes num op expression. This allows the first tokens we set aside to be added to the tree at the proper level above the subtree construct from the previous reduction. So again, we reduce the tokens at the top of the stack into the top level expression non-terminal. So now we've reached the end of our tokens, and since we were able to perform a valid reduction, we know that the input was a valid grammatical sentence in our math language, and our parser can accept it and create the final tree. So these are two types of approaches to parsing. Top-down or recursive descent parsers are the most commonly written by hand, whereas bottom-up, uh, bottom which you might sometimes hear called LALR parsers, are much harder to write. Unsurprisingly, the more grammar rules that you have, the harder it is to construct the parser. But fortunately, there are tools that make parsers for you. These tools are called parser generators, and all they need is a grammar file with all the rules that determine the language you want to parse, and it'll spit out a parser for you. Those grammar files were like the wacky .wav files that we saw at the beginning of the slide deck, but now that we understand how grammar rules are written, we can see it's not that different from the BNF notation that we've been using. If you're using rack as your generator, for example, it expects a class with a rules section, and that's where you define your grammar rules. So here, you can see that the rule for the non-terminal symbol expression consists of a num token followed by an operator and then, and then another num token. When this sequence gets hit by the parser, it executes the Ruby code that you specify inside the block. We saw this earlier in the bottom-up parser that when a grammar rule is fulfilled, the parser performs some action. The grammar file also comes with a tokenizer, which is how the parser genera generator understands what the non-terminal tokens are. But it's pretty similar to the one that we saw before, so I didn't include it for space reasons. So all that's left is to pass that file uh, to Rack or Bison, and it should generate a file that can now parse whatever input for the language that you specified. You don't even need to, need to do anything or look at the file, but if you did, it would look something like this. The numbers in the various tables here simply correspond to the different actions the parser needs to take. But for the most part, you don't even have to worry about it, and now you have a parser. In Ruby, we can sort of see this in action by executing a Ruby script using the dash Y flag. So here is the terminal output when you execute the Ruby script containing our math expression with the dash Y flag. Each step outputs which state you're in, which correspond to the numbers in the state transition tables that we saw on the previous slide. And you can also see that the parser is either shifting to the next token or reducing the stack based on some grammar rule. Interestingly enough, if you look at the documentation for Ruby, it actually says to never use this flag, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> so you may ask, when would I actually use a parser? And this is a great question, because there are a lot of situations in which you, you can use a parser. For example, you could use one if you're validating a string, such as a URL or email address, or maybe extracting information from the body of an email or log file, or even converting some kind of formatted document into another. So for example, markdown to HTML. But now you might be thinking, well, I validated strings before just using regexes. 
And it's true, for, a simple, for some simple string input, you probably could use a simple regex. But has anyone here actually tried to validate, for example, a URL using a regex? Because if you did, following the rules of how URLs are constructed, you might have ended up with something like this, <laughs> which is terrible. You pretty much never want something like this in your code because it's hard to read. Don't try to read it. I know some of you are like trying to figure out this regex right now. Um, and it probably doesn't even cover all the cases that you need it to. And the reason for this is because there's a really important distinction in languages, even string languages, to take into consideration. And that is that all languages belong to a hierarchy. <clears throat> the established hierarchy for languages, which is first introduced by the linguist Noam Chomsky, has four types. The first type is unrestricted. And this is the category that, um, that most natural languages, such as English or Japanese, fall into. Uh, these are languages that do not have regular or consistent grammars and which can be ambiguous. Type one is called contact sensitive, which you don't really care about for the purposes of this talk, um, but then we get into type two and three. Type two languages are what are known as context-free languages, and most programming languages are type two. But you don't even have to be a language as complicated as, for example, Python to be considered context-free, as we'll see in a minute. Finally, type three languages are what are called regular languages, and these are the only type, uh, only kind of languages that can be properly parsed by regular, expressions, regular expression engines. But what does it mean for a language to be either context, uh, regular versus context-free? For the most part, it all boils down to the grammar. For regular languages, all grammar rules can be expressed as a single non-terminal symbol on the left-hand side, and either a terminal or a nil on the right-hand side. This terminal can sometimes have a non-terminal before it or after it, but not both. On the other hand, context-free languages have more flexible grammar rules. When the left-hand side is still a single non-terminal, the right-hand side can be a sequence of terminals and non-terminals. And as it turns out, most languages, languages aren't regular. Let's take a really simple language that you think is so simple that you could think um, you, would, you could use a regex to parse it. So consider the AB language. The rules for this language are that you have a series of A's followed by the same number of B's. So valid sentences could include A, B, A, A, B, B, and so forth. And an invalid sentence could be a series of all A's, or A, B, B, um, or A, B, A, B alternating, and so forth. So if we were to try to write some grammar rules for it, we might start with something like um, a non-terminal A equals the lowercase a, and the, and the non-terminal B, uh, B equals this um, string B. So then we can construct a sentence S um, as a sequence AB. But since that only gives us one sentence, um, in order to produce all possible ones, we would have to have AB becomes AABB, and then AABB becomes AAAABBBB, and so forth. So obviously that doesn't work because you'd have to go on forever. You had an infinite number of grammar rules. This is basically the same as figuring out if you have balanced parentheses. So what is the grammar? Thanks to parser generators, coming up with the grammar is the hardest part to uh, writing a parser. Um, but sometimes you have to come up, the, that, that actual come up, coming up the rule is a bit tricky. So I'm gonna skip over this for time, um, but the, the rules end up being that using BNF notation, you would have a, um, a statement S, which is basically an A and a B, um, with another statement token inserted in between the A and B. If we specif specify that S can also be nil, then that provides the only terminal you need to cover all the cases of our deceptively simple seeming AB language. Remembering that a grammar rule for a regular language can't have a sequence of terminals and non-terminals on the right-hand side, we can see that this language is in fact a context-free language. So as I mentioned, not everyone is in the business of implementing a programming language from scratch, but using grammars is useful in everyday work, such as understanding internet standards. For example, uh, here are rules that describe the syntax of HTTP auth headers uh, from RFC 2617, which specifies HTTP authentication. A Ruby implementation of this standard can be found in the net HTTP auth dig uh, digest auth gem, but you could also implement a parser using these rules to check for just the validity of an input. Except for email. To validate email, just send the email. Another example of a parser used outside of the context of parsing a computer language can be found in the open source tools that we use every day. Both Bundler and RubyGems read a lock file to resolve gem dependencies, but they use very different approaches. Bundler just uses regular expressions to match each line of your lock file, whereas RubyGems has a full-on lexer and top-down parser, which in this situation is probably the better solution. 
The reason for this is that in the bundler parser, there is no error checking for a corrupted line in your lock file. You can add some, but this would require special error handling, probably using different regular expressions for each error case, and the difficulty of maintaining this would scale very quickly. It's also, it also uses a sort of messy regular expression matching that requires a separate constant for each type of indentation in your, in your gem file lock, and it's not hard to see that this is a pretty fragile code design. On the other hand, RubyGems uses a tokenizer and a recursive descent parser to parse the lock file. This means that any time the parser gets a new token, if it's not the type that it expects, a meaningful parse error is thrown, and there's no special handling necessary for any kind of corrupted line in your gem file lock. So as we've seen, you don't really need that much complexity before you get out of regular expression parsable territory. Because of that, you're going to be better off probably by figuring out the grammar rules for the thing that you're trying to parse and using a parser instead. This also ensures greater accuracy in what you're trying to parse. For example, there are a number of web servers that use a parser for HTTP requests, such as Raggle or Jetty. But even as recently as earlier this year, um, there was a vulnerability uncovered in Jetty, which is used in Java servlets, that prints debug information in your response. The other thing about parsers is that they're often a faster way of getting what you need done, done. So for example, in a web framework, if you use a parser for your routes, then you can build a tree which makes routing much, much faster than a linear look through. It makes it logarithmic time instead. Um, also, a quick benchmark of the RubyGems parser versus the Bundler parser also seems to indicate that the recursive descent parser in RubyGems is faster. So I'll leave the analysis of that to the future. Um, so of course, parsers are hard to write, but thanks to parser generators, all you need to figure out is the grammar. There were a lot of resources that I used to prepare for this talk. Um, these are some of them. You can uh, post the slides later. Um, Ruby under a microscope is really great, and I think it's uh, on sale downstairs. And thank you very much. Thank you.